What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the 2012 AP Calc AB multiple choice no calculator section. And the first question here, we're taking the derivative of x sine x. So we have to show up to the test knowing our formulas, and for this one, we're going to use the product rule. So this is the formula we're going to need. Don't fall into the trap of doing 1 times cosine x, which they don't even leave that as an answer choice, so you can't even step in that trap if they wanted you to. So here, u is equal to x, v is equal to sine x, so we do the derivative of the first thing, which is 1, times the second thing, which is sine x, plus, and then we have x times the derivative of the second thing is going to be cosine x. So now we just simplify this, and this is going to match up with choice b. For the second question here, we're looking for the intervals in which the function f is increasing. Now, the moment I hear that phrase in calculus, f is increasing, I just think f prime of x has to be positive. So then I look at what do they give us? They gave us f of x. So the first thing I would do is find f prime of x, which is going to be 300 minus 3x squared. We're just doing power rule here. And now we're going to set this equal to 0. So I'm going to factor out a 3 preemptively, and we'll have 3 times 100 minus x squared is equal to 0. And this is going to give us roots of x equals plus or minus 10. Now, a nice little shortcut for this is that when you're making your sign chart for the derivative, in the event that your derivative is a quadratic function, you could spend the time to plug in test values like negative 11, 0, and positive 11. But what I think about is that we have a negative x squared. So that means our derivative, if we think about what it looks like, is it's going to be a parabola, and we'll change colors. That looks like this. And the roots are at negative 10 and positive 10. So this thing starts out negative. Then it goes over the x-axis, so it goes positive and then it goes negative again. Now, once again, you could spend the time to plug in values before, in between, and after the critical points, but I like using these little shortcuts here. And now, on which of the following intervals is the function f increasing? Just from negative 10 to 10. So now we just look here, negative 10 to 10 is gonna pair up with choice b. Now, question three could be really easy if you show up knowing your formulas. The antiderivative of secant tangent is equal to secant x, and then just sprinkle in the plus c, so this is going to match up with choice A. In the event that you forget this formula, you could go through all the answer choices and take a derivative. And if you forget the derivative of secant x, just think of instead of taking the derivative of secant, you're taking the derivative of 1 over cosine x. And when you do all this work, this is going to simplify to secant x tangent x. And that would also tell you that this is going to be choice A. Question four, we're going to take the derivative and plug in 1. So we have f prime of x equals the derivative of 7x is 7. And then we have minus the derivative of 3 is 0, plus the derivative of natural log x is 1 over x. So then here, f prime of 1, we just plug in. This is going to give us 7 plus 1 over 1, and that's going to simplify to 8. So 4 is going to be choice E. Question 5, we want to know which of the following statements is false. So the limit as x approaches 2 exists. That is a true statement because as we come in from the left side and the right side, the limit is approaching 2. So our limit would be equal to 2 here. So that is a true statement. So that means it's out. The limit as x approaches 3 exists. That is also true because notice as we come in from the left and right side, we're heading up to 5. So this is true. So b is out. The limit as x approaches 4 exists is a false statement because notice that the left side limit is heading towards positive 2 and the right side limit is heading towards positive 4. So this one is true because we have a jump discontinuity here. And when you have a jump discontinuity, that's a type of discontinuity where the left and right side limits don't match. Now, the limit as x approaches 5 exists is a true statement because the limit is heading towards 6. So even though you know it's choice C, it's good to just practice saying why the uh, other answers are wrong. And now the function is continuous at 3 is a true statement because we could draw this portion of the graph in one motion like this. So E is out, definitely choice C. For question 6, we have a particle moving left and right, and the velocity is given by this function here, and we want total distance traveled from 0 to 3. Now, total distance traveled is the integral of absolute value velocity. And in this case, we're going from 0 to 3. So one thing you have to look out for in a question like this is to see if any part of the velocity graph goes under the t-axis or the x-axis. So here, what I would do first is I would factor this out. So this is our velocity function. I'm going to set velocity equal to 0. So we would have t times 6 minus t. Setting that equal to 0 tells us that we have two roots of t equals 0 and t equals 6. So what this thing actually looks like, just so we get a sense of what's going on, is we have a root at 0, and we have a root at 6. And because this is a negative t squared equation, that means it's going to be an upside down parabola like this. So what's nice about this question is that to find the actual total distance traveled 
from zero to three, what we're doing is just finding the area under this portion of the curve. And notice the entire graph is above the T axis at this time. So we don't have to worry about any sign changes involved with the absolute value. So this, we could just do the integral from zero to three of six T minus T squared. If they wanted to make this question more challenging, they would have had us look at a portion of the graph where the velocity is negative, and we would have to consider the absolute value idea, but this, we're just gonna go straight forward. So now the antiderivative of 6t, we're gonna have 6t squared divided by two, which gives us 3t squared minus, and we have one third t to the third power. And we don't have a calculator for this, so it's nice that we're plugging in three and zero. So we have three times three squared minus one third, and then three to the third power is 27. And then we subtract, we plug in zero, we're just gonna get zero. So this 27 over three is gonna give us nine. And then three times three times three is 27. 27 minus nine is 18. So for six, we're going with choice D. For question seven, we have chain rule. We have to do the derivative of the outside. We keep the inside the same. So we're gonna keep the inside as X to the third minus cosine X. And then we multiply all of this by the derivative of the inside, which is gonna be three X squared minus the derivative of cosine is minus sine x. So minus minus sine x becomes plus sine x. And this is going to match up with choice E. Question eight is a massive topic. The idea that the integral of the rate tells you the net change of the function. So we have a tank with 40 liters of oil at time t equals four. So at the start of the question, it's very important that we consider there's already 50 liters in this tank. And oil is pumped in at this rate. And we have select values of R of t in the table. We're using a right Riemann sum with three subintervals, and we want to approximate the number of liters at 15 hours. So what we're actually doing here is 50 plus the integral from 4 to 15 of R of t dt. Now, the reason why we're integrating this is because, remember, the units here are liters per hour, and the units for dt are hours. So when you multiply liters per hour by hours, it tells you just liters. And be mindful, this was already 50 liters at the start. So this we're going to approximate is 50 plus. And for a right Riemann sum, we're going to be using the three y values to the right. So these are going to come into play. The next thing we have to be careful finding is the delta x's. So the first delta x from 4 to 7 is a change of 3. The second delta x is going from 7 to 12, which is a 5. And then the third delta x is going from 12 to 15, which brings us back to 3. So don't assume that they're always the same because that's a little trap that they set. So now the first delta x3 is going to be paired up with 6.2. Now we have plus. The next delta x is 5 times 5.9. And then plus we have 3 times, so let's make that a little better, 3 times 5.6. So now we have a little bit of annoying math to do on the side. So this is going to be 50 plus, well, 3 times 6 is 18, and we have 3 times 0.2 is 0.6. So that's gonna be 18.6. Or you could do long multiplication on the side. This one, if I was doing in my head or wanna show on the side, 5.9, I just think of as six minus 0 0.1. So when I multiply that by five, that's gonna be 30 minus 0 0.5, and that's gonna be 29.5. And then three times 5.6, well, three times five is 15, three times 0.6 is 1.8, and 15 plus 1.8 is 16.8. Okay, or once again, just do long multiplication on the side. So now we just got to add these numbers up. We have 50, we have 18.6. So this is like elementary school math we got to know too. So that's what's nice about this section is it tests us on all of our math. So now just be careful adding. We have 8 plus 5 is 13, and then 13 plus 6 is 19. So we have a 9, bring down the decimal, carry the 1 from the 19. 1 plus 8 is 9, 9 plus 9 is 18, 18 plus 6 is 24 carry up the two, and then we have seven plus one is eight, plus two is 10, plus one is 11. So 114.9 is choice C. Question nine, for what value of K is F continuous at X equals two? So we have to know this definition for the free response especially, but it's also important for the multiple choice. F is continuous at X equals two if the limit as X approaches two of F of X is equal to F of two. So in three steps, the first thing you do is find the limit as X approaches two. So the limit as X approaches two we would use this part of the piecewise function because that's the only way we could go close to the left and right of two is when x is not equal to two. So now we just plug in that part of the function and we could just do a little bit of algebra here. So the x minus twos are gonna cancel out and when you plug in two, 
2 times 2 plus 1 is going to give you 5. And now here, f of 2, they're telling us is equal to k. So the only way this is going to be continuous is when the limit as x approaches 2 of the function is equal to the function value. So that means we need k to equal 5, and this is going to be choice e. So for question 10, we have to know how to sketch basic functions. So e to the x over 2, I'm just going to draw something that looks like e to the x because we have e to a positive power. So it's not going to go up as fast as e to the x, but it's going to go up like this. And then we're finding the area of the region. We're in quadrant 1. We're bounded by this graph and the line x equals 2. So that means the portion of the graph that we're looking at is this portion here. This is what we're finding the area of. So to find this area here, where once again, this is the function e to the x over 2. To find this area, we're going to do the integral of e to the x over 2 dx from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Now, it really helps to have certain formulas down because you don't want to have to do a u substitution for everything. But anytime you have an integral in the form of e to the kx dx like this, I just like to know that this is 1 over k e to the kx plus c if it's indefinite, but we have a definite integral here. So in this scenario here, it's like k is equal to 1 half. So the antiderivative here, I'm going to have e to the x over 2. But since k is equal to a half, 1 divided by a half is going to give us a coefficient of 2. OK, so this is just something that's really helpful for a question like this. Because once again, you don't want to have to do a u sub when your u term would be something linear, something like u equals x over 2 or 1 half x. It's not really making a lot of sense to do a u sub in a situation like that. This formula is very helpful. So now all we do here is I like to keep the constant on the outside, and then I plug in the upper lower limit and subtract. So we'd have e to the 2 over 2 minus e to the 0 over 2. So this is going to be 2 times e to the first, which is just e, minus e to the 0 is 1. So this is 2 times parentheses e minus 1, which we could simplify as 2e minus 2, and it's going to match choice A. For question 11, I just focus here on the absolute value part. And for one, I know that the absolute value of x on its own is a function that's continuous everywhere. But at 0, we have a sharp turn. So absolute value of x is not differentiable at x equals 0. So if we change gears here and focus on the graph of absolute value x minus 2, the same concept applies, that this function is continuous everywhere. However, at x equals 2, 0, this function is continuous but not differentiable. So throwing in the square root doesn't change a whole lot. It'll change the, the rate of growth here, but what it's not going to change is the fact that the function is continuous but not differentiable at x equals 2. So here, f is differentiable at x equals 2. That's not going to be true, because if you take the derivative of f of x, at some point you're going to have to take the derivative of the inside function when you do chain rule. And at x equals 2, you're going to have all sorts of problems. Now, f is not continuous at x equals 2. This is not a problem for us. f is continuous at x equals 2. Because for one, f of 2 is defined. And if you plug in values a little bit after 2 and a little bit before 2, you might be worried about a negative square root. But the absolute value keeps everything under the square root positive. So f is continuous. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is not 0. Well, that's not true. The limit is equal to 0 because our function is continuous at x equals 2. So that means the limit and function value are the same. And then x equals 2 is a vertical asymptote. The only way you're going to get vertical asymptotes is when you have a denominator function. I'm sorry, a denominator in your function where the denominator is 0 and no factors cancel out. So definitely choice A. Question 12, we have to know u sub for definite integrals. So we have u equals square root x, which we could call x to the 1 half power. And that tells us that du is equal to 1 half x to the minus half power dx like this. And what you could do is uh, a lot of students prefer to solve for dx directly. So we could multiply both sides by 2, and that'll get rid of the half. So we have this. And then what we could do is divide both sides by x to the negative half. So we have 2 du divided by x to the negative half equals dx. So this is one part of the question here. We have u. We calculate du, solve for dx. And then the next thing we should do is find our new limits. So the old limits, it's very important to know, are in terms of x. So it's x equals 4 and x equals 1. So if you want the new limits in terms of u, you're going to plug in x equals 4 to your definition of u. And you'll have u equals 4 to the 1 half. And 4 to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of 4, which is 2. And then you plug in x equals 1, you'll have 1 to the half power, which is equal to 1. So now we're ready to transform this integral. 
the integral is now not going to go from 1 to 4. It's going to go from u equals 1 to u equals 2. You're going to have e to the u power. You could write the square root x here on bottom. And notice here dx. What we have is we're going to have dx is equal to 2 du over x to the negative half. And x to the negative half, you could think of x to the negative half as a side note as 1 over square root x. So we have a 1 over square root x in the denominator. And notice these cancel out. Square root x over square root x is going to cancel. And this simplified is going to be 2 times the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the u du. And now we just got to match this. This is going to match up with choice C. Question 13, properties of integrals. And we're taking the integral of a piecewise function. So notice this function is defined and the split point is at x equals 3. So if we're going from 1 to 5, we're going to do the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx. And then we're going to do plus the integral from 3 to 5 of f of x dx. So we have to read the piecewise function carefully. So what we have here, we could just think that f of x for this part is going to be just 2. And then f of x for the second part is going to be x minus 1. So when we're going through the fundamental theorem here, the antiderivative of 2 is 2x. And we're going from 1 to 3 plus the antiderivative of x minus 1 is going to be 1 half x squared minus x. But this one, we're going from 3 to 5. So now we just have to be very careful with the arithmetic. So here, this is going to be 2 times 3 minus 1, plus, and we'll make that a little bit darker, plus, and then we have, for this one is a little bit more tedious. We have 1 half times 5 squared is 25, minus 5. And then we have minus, we plug in 3, and we're going to have 9 over 2, we do 3 squared over 2, and then minus 3. So now just very carefully we have to simplify this. This is 2 times 2 is 4. Plus, now we have 25 over 2 minus 9 over 2. And if you do 25 over 2 minus 9 over 2, that's going to give you 16 over 2. So these two together are going to make 16 over 2 when they combine. And then we have minus 5 minus minus 3. That's going to change to minus 5 in a sense plus 3, which is going to give you minus 2. So this works out to 8. So we have 4 plus 8 is 12. Minus 2 is equal to 10. So this is going to work out to choice D. Question 14 is chain rule again. And the chain rule is going to show up a lot and in different forms. The derivative of f of g of x. So when we have f of g of x and we go prime here, this is the chain rule in function notation. So you have to know how to do the chain rule many different ways. And this is one of them. So if you want this derivative at x equals 3, then you have f prime g of 3 times g prime of 3. So now we just got to look at what pieces we have. So for 1, g of 3, if you use this, g of 3 is 3 times 3 minus 2, and 9 minus 2 is 7. And then we also have to know f prime of x here. So f prime of x, we could just find all these pieces. f prime of x is going to be equal to, and we got to do the chain rule within the chain rule. So this is just... Uh, going to be a bit of a mess. So this, I just think of everything to the 1 half. So we have 1 half x squared minus 4 to the negative half, and the derivative of the inside is 2x. So then this cancels out. And this we could rewrite as x over radical x squared minus 4. So this is f prime of x. And then another thing we have to know is g prime of x, but g prime of x is nice and simple. g prime of x is equal to 3. All right, so we have all of our pieces. So here, now we just plug everything in. So what we're going to have is we're going to have f prime of g of 3 we found to be 7 times g prime of 3. But the beauty of g prime is g prime is constant. So no matter what we plug in, we're just going to get 3. So now f prime of 7, we could find this is going to be 7 over square root of, and that's going to give us 49 minus 4, which is going to give us 45. And notice it's one of those radicals that simplifies. This is equal to 9 times 5. So we'll just go ahead and do that. 7 over radical 9, radical 5. So this is 7 over 3, radical 5. So now we just plug that in. We have 7 over 3, radical 5, times 3. And the 3 over 3 is going to cancel. So this is just 7 over radical 5. And that's going to be choice A. So this question here is a classic. We have h of x, h prime, h double prime. And we have to think about what each of them mean. So h is an area function. So when they talk about something like h of 6, h of 6 is the area under the curve. So h of 6, if I just put a 6 here, is the area under the curve 
from 0 to 6. And what we should note here is that the area under the curve from 0 to 6, no matter what the value is, we could just assume based on the graph that it's negative. And now h prime of x, this is where we have to know the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. And the derivative of this equation, we have h prime equals f of x. So then when we want to talk about h prime of 6, h prime of 6 is equal to f of 6. And f of 6, the function value here, this is a graph of f, is equal to 0. So this is equal to 0. And then h double prime of x would be equal to f prime of x. So when we think about what is h double prime of 6, that's equal to f prime of 6. And f prime of 6 means the slope of the line tangent to the curve at x equals 6. And notice the function is increasing here. So that value is going to be positive. So now we have to order these, and we're going least to greatest, because these are all less than signs. The smallest value in the list is going to be h, because h is the only one that's negative. So h has to be first, which means these are gone. And then 0 would be the next value, because 0 is less than whatever this positive value is. So it would be h, h prime, and h double prime. This is going to be choice A. For question 16, you have to be a robot with your definitions. For what values of t is the particle at rest? When I hear particle is at rest, I automatically think velocity is equal to 0. So since they gave us a position function here, if I want to talk about velocity, we need to take the derivative of position. So velocity here. And the laziest way to do this is just to do the product rule. The derivative of t minus a is 1. So we have 1 times t minus b plus, and then we would have t minus a times the derivative of t minus b, which is 1. And be mindful, they told us a and b are constants. So the derivative of the constant is equal to 0. That's why we're just getting the derivative of t minus a is 1, and the derivative of t minus b is also 1. So now we just simplify this a little bit. So we have t minus b plus t minus a. That's going to give you t plus t is 2t. And then we have minus b minus a. But remember, the particle's at rest when velocity is equal to 0. So that tells you 2 times t is equal to add these to both sides. And you're going to get a plus b. And then just divide by 2. So t equals a plus b over 2. This is going to be choice b. Question 17 takes up a lot of space, so we'll scroll as we need it. And what we have here is this is a graph of f. And f of x is the integral from 2 to x of g. Which of the following could be a graph of g of x? So to get g of x out of this, take the derivative of both sides. And that's going to tell you f prime of x is equal to g of x. So what we're really looking for here, which of the following could be a graph of y equals g of x? Or we could say which of the following could be a graph of the derivative f prime? So that means like if we look at the graph of f, notice this is linear. So it's a linear function. It has a positive slope, which we'll abbreviate, and it has a negative y-intercept. So it has a negative y-intercept. So if I had to make up a random function for f, f of x, let's just say f of x is equal to 2x minus 1, then f prime of x would be equal to just 2. So we have f is a linear function with a positive slope, so f prime would be a linear function, but it's a constant function. Something like y equals 2, which would be a horizontal line. So choice A is already looking good because this, notice our horizontal line is above the x-axis. So it's already looking like choice A, but we'll just go through the others to see why those are no good. So why can't this be a graph of f prime or g? Well, this is a negative constant. And that would only make sense if the original graph was a downward sloping line. So this one's out. Now this one here wouldn't make sense at all because if our original function was a positive slope, when we take the derivative, we'll have a horizontal line, and this is not a horizontal line. So here, this one's no good because it's quadratic. So if your, if your original function is linear, your derivative is not going to be quadratic. So this one's not it. And then choice E is a negative quadratic, so same logic as before. This one is out, and definitely choice A. Question 18, you can know the definition of the derivative as a limit, this one here. Or the best way to go through something like this I think is to just use L'Hopital's rule. So this is option one, but my favorite way to do questions like this is just to apply L'Hopital's rule, which we can here, because if you plug in zero, you're gonna get zero over zero. And if we apply L'Hopital's rule, be mindful we're taking the derivative with respect to h, not x. So we have one over four plus h, and if you forget to do the chain rule, that's okay, because the derivative of four plus h is one. Minus natural log four, this is a constant. So that derivative is zero, don't say one over four and then over the derivative of h is 1. Now we plug in 0 for h, and we're going to get 1 fourth minus 0 over 1, which is equal to 1 fourth 
So this one is going to be choice B. Question 19, I could tell already is going to be very tedious. We have what points on the graph have the property that the line tangent to F at X, Y has a slope of one half. So really what they're telling you to do there is just set the derivative F prime of X equal to a half. So here we have to know the quotient rule. So F prime of X, we're going to do low D high. So we have X plus two times the derivative of the top is one minus the high function X times the derivative of the bottom is one and over the denominator squared. So this is our derivative. We could clean it up a little bit. F prime of X, this is X plus two minus X, which is going to give you two on top over X plus two squared. So now we just have to do a little bit of algebra. We're going to set the derivative one half equal to the actual equation. So we have two over X plus two squared equals one half like this. We could cross multiply and that's going to give us X plus two squared equals two times two is four. Now just be very careful with this part. If you say the square root of x plus two squared is just x plus two, then that's a very dangerous trap because you have to include the plus or minus. Okay, that's the square root property. And the square root of four is equal to two. So you're solving two simultaneous equations. x plus two is either equal to positive two or you have x plus two is equal to negative two. And that's gonna give you x equals zero and x equals negative four. So if you're not careful here, you might only look at the point where x is equal to zero. So now we just have to think about this carefully. If you plug in zero to the original equation, you get y is equal to zero. And when you plug x equals negative four in, you're gonna have, and we'll just do that, negative four over negative four plus two is negative two, and that's gonna give you positive two. So it looks like the two points where this happens are zero, zero, and negative four, two, and it's gonna correspond with choice C. So they're telling us here, g is the inverse of f, so that means g of x equals f inverse of x. And we're taking the derivative of g at x equals 1. So you have to know your formula for the derivative of f inverse. So that tells us g prime of x is equal to, and this notation, you could write it like this, f inverse prime of x. And the formula you need to know is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Okay, the proof of this formula involves the chain rule. So this is really just chain rule in disguise, but it really helps to just show up to the AP test knowing these formulas. So then here we want g prime of 1. So what we're really looking for, g prime of 1, is equal to, we're plugging in 1 here and here, is 1 over f prime, and then we've got f inverse of 1. So we have to know, what is f inverse of 1? Well, if f of 0 is equal to 1, f inverse of 1 is equal to 0, because in the inverse world, the points are flipped. So this means we're going to look for 1 over f prime of 0. So now we see here, f of x is this. So f prime of x, and here's the chain rule again. The chain rule is going to show up a million times. So 3 times 2x plus 1 to the second times the derivative of the inside is 2. So that's really just 3 times 2 is 6. So this is going to be 1 over 6 times. And when we plug in 0, we have 0 plus 1 squared, which is 1 squared. And this is just going to be 1 over 6. So this is going to work out to choice D. Now there's a million formulas you have to know, but when you're looking for a horizontal asymptote and the horizontal asymptote is at y equals five, just know that the, the concept is that if you have a function f of x and you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals five, that means that the limit as x goes to infinity of your function is gonna be equal to five. So what you need to be able to do at hyperspeed is you have to be able to find limits at infinity very quickly. So looking at this, this limit goes to infinity right away. This limit, sine is bounded between 1 and negative 1. So when I do 1 to negative 1 divided by infinity, this is going to 0. So this is out, this is out. This goes to 0 as x goes to infinity because I have 1 over infinity. This one here uh, is almost the answer, but this would have a horizontal asymptote of 5 over negative 1, which is negative 5. So it's not this. So by process of elimination, it has to be this. But if we took the limit as x goes to infinity, remember the leading terms are the only things that matter. So you'd have 20x squared on top over the leading term on bottom is 4x squared. And then these would cancel, 20 over 4 is 5, definitely choice E. So question 22, we have a function f of x and we want the absolute maximum value of f. So if you want an absolute max and you don't have a closed interval, that means this is gonna have exactly one critical point and we're gonna have a sign change from positive to negative there. So here, we take the derivative and we could use the quotient rule again. So we have the bottom function x times the derivative of the top function is one, 1 over x minus the top function natural log x times the derivative of x is 1 
over x squared. Now, looking at this, we should mention the domain is x greater than 0 because natural log is only, is only defined for positive values of x. So here, x times 1 over x is 1 minus ln x over x squared. So when we set the derivative equal to 0, we have a fraction. We're going to set just the numerator equal to 0. And 1 minus ln x is equal to 0 when we have natural log x equals 1. And this you could solve a few ways, but if you exponentiate both sides like this, it's going to tell you x equals e to the first, or x equals e. So what is the absolute maximum value of f? We have to be careful. We have to make sure we plug this back into the function. f of e is equal to natural log e over e, which is going to be equal to 1 over e. So this is going to be choice b. Now, this is multiple choice, and like I said before, I knew there was only going to be one critical point, and that has to be the side of our absolute max. But if I had to show more work for this in the free response, I would make a sign chart for f prime starting at 0 and going greater. The critical point here was that x equals e. And if we were to plug in something before e, like 1, we would have natural log of 1 here is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1 over 1 squared is positive. And if you plug in something bigger than e, like e squared, if you plugged in e squared, you'd have 1 minus ln of e squared. The 2 would come down in front. You'd have 1 minus 2 is negative. And see, there's the only sign change from positive to negative in our first derivative. So this would have to be an absolute maximum at x equals e. Question 23, you have to read through a few times. It's a little bit of a strange question. But we have p of t is the size of the population. So let's just make sure we don't cross it out. Size of the population. Which of the following differential equations describes linear growth in the size of the population? So if p of t represents the population and we have linear growth, that means our graph could look potentially something like this. So then dp over dt would have to be constant because if we have linear growth, if our function is a linear function, then the derivative of a linear function is just the slope. So let's say here that this line has a slope of 200, then dp over dt would be 200. So just be mindful of this. If, you, if your function is linear, then your derivative is going to be constant. So definitely choice A. Question 24, we have g of x. K is constant, and we want to know for what value of K does G have a critical point at X equals 2 thirds? So the first thing that jumps out at me there is if G has a critical point at 2 thirds, we could say that G prime of 2 thirds is equal to 0 or is undefined. But in this case, it looks like G prime of 2 thirds is equal to 0 because X squared and E are both continuous functions. So then here, what we have next is we should find G prime of X. So we're going to do product rule and chain rule here. So the derivative of the first term is 2x times the second term is e to the kx. And then we have plus x squared times the derivative of e to the kx is ke to the kx. So now we're going to make use of that fact that g prime of 2 thirds is equal to 0. So we plug in 2 thirds, and we could set all of this equal to 0. So now we have 2 times 2 thirds is going to give us, well, we'll just write it out, 2 times 2 thirds times e to the k times 2 thirds is 2 thirds k plus and then we have 2 thirds squared and 2 thirds times 2 thirds is 4 ninths and we have k e to the k times 2 thirds is 2 thirds k so at this step here I would factor out e to the 2 thirds k on both sides or on both pieces of this expression and we could set this whole thing equal to 0 as well because we said g prime of 2 thirds is equal to 0 so once we do that we're going to have e to the 2 thirds k factored out. And left, we're going to have 2 times 2 thirds is 4 thirds. Plus, and we're going to have 4 ninths k. And this is all equal to 0. Now, when you look at this first term, it's e to some power. And e to any power is always positive. So that means we're not going to get a root out of this. But we can get a root out of that second factor. So we have 4 thirds plus 4 ninths k is equal to 0. Now, there's a lot of ways you could handle this algebraically. Some people might prefer, we'll make this a little bit neater, to multiply everything by 9 first. And if you do 9 times 4 thirds, 9 over 3 is 3, and 3 times 4 is 12. Plus, 9 times 4 ninths, the 9 over 9 would cancel, giving you just 4k equals 0. And then from here, you could see 12 minus 12 is equal to 0. So k would have to be equal to negative 3. And this is going to match up with choice A. Question 25, we have a differential equation, and we're going to solve this using separation of variables. So we can multiply both sides by dx, and that's going to give us dy equals 2 sine x 
times dx. So that's just our first step of algebra. And then to solve for y, do the antiderivative of both sides. You're going to have y equals the antiderivative of 2 sine x is minus 2 cosine x. But we're just going to tack on a plus c here. And now the initial condition helps you solve for the value of c. So we have y of pi equals negative 2 cosine pi plus c. And this is going to be equal to 1. So what that tells us, since cosine pi is negative 1, negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2. So we have positive 2 plus c equals 1, which tells us that c is equal to negative 1. And now we plug that back into this equation here. And that tells us that our true answer is y equals negative 2 cosine x minus 1. And this is going to match up with choice E. For question 26, we have g prime of x is here. And we want to know which of the following things must be true on the interval from 0 to 2. So for a question like this, we're just going to do a sketch of e to the minus x squared, which if we sketch this out, this is going to be always positive and decreasing. And we're specifically focusing on what's going on from 0 to 2. So it looks something kind of like this. But we're looking on the space from 0 to 2. And notice g prime is the area under this curve. And notice from 0 to 2, that area is always positive. So no matter how far I go from 0 on, that area is going to be positive. So that tells us that g prime is greater than 0 on the interval from 0 to 2. And if g prime is positive on that interval, that means g is increasing, which means these answer choices are out. g has to be increasing. Now, the next thing we could use here is that g double prime of x, the derivative of g prime is equal to the derivative of that area function, which is equal to e to the minus x squared. So taking the derivative of both sides gives us this equation. And remember, this is always positive. So this function is always positive. So that means g double prime is always going to be greater than 0. And if g double prime is always greater than 0, this means that our function is also concave up. So that's what's going to eliminate choice b, telling us that our function here is increasing and our function is concave up. For question 27, we want to know the value of the second derivative at 3, 0. Now, for something like this, I might just go ahead and do this first. I'll do some algebra before I do the derivative and just divide both sides by x plus 2y. And you have 2x minus y over x plus 2y. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of this. So we have the second derivative. And we have to use the quotient rule. And just know, any time we take a derivative of a y term, we have to tack on a dy dx. So we have the low function x plus 2y times the derivative of the high function, which is 2 minus dy dx. Okay, so the derivative of 2x is 2, and the derivative of y is dy dx. And then we have minus, we have the high function, 2x minus y, times the derivative of the low function is 1 plus 2 dy dx. And now we're going to divide by, we have the denominator squared. So for this one here, eventually we have to plug in the point 3, 0. But for these annoying terms here, the dy dx's, what I would do ahead of time is evaluate the derivative at the point 3, 0. So before we plug 3, 0 into this, we'll go ahead and plug 3, 0 into the first derivative. And that's going to give us 2 times 3 minus 0 over 3 plus 2 times 0. And that's going to give us 6 divided by 3, which is equal to 2. So anytime we encounter one of these, we're just going to replace it with a 2. So right away, just looking at this, I could see that if we're plugging in x equals 3 and y equals 0, that tells us, and I'll just use simpler notation here. We'll just say y double prime equals x equals 3. So we have 3 plus 2 times 0 times, and now we have 2 minus, the derivative was equal to 2. So right away, 2 minus 2, this whole piece is going to cancel out. And then we have minus... 2 times x equals 3. So remember, x equals 3 and y equals 0. So we have 2 times x equals 3 minus y is 0 times 1 plus 2 times dy dx was equal to 2. And then we're dividing all of this by, so it's a messy expression. We have x equals 3. So we have 3 plus 0 squared like this. So we'll simplify this a little bit. Now we have minus 2 times 3 minus 0 is 6. And then we have 1 plus 2 times 2, which is going to be 5 over. And we're dividing by 9 because we have 3 squared. So this, if we simplify, divide the top and bottom by 3, and this becomes a 2 thirds. So this works out to negative 10 thirds. And negative 10 thirds is going to correspond with choice A.
So final question of the no calculator. We're looking for the acceleration of the particle at the point where the velocity is first equal to zero. So we're going to find the velocity function. We're just going to take the derivative of the position function. And that's going to give us, we have the derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So we have minus minus sine, which becomes plus sine t. And now we're going to set the velocity equal to zero. And notice t is greater than or equal to zero. So what this gives us when you set this equal to zero is you're going to have cosine t equals minus sine t. And now be careful here. Pi over 4 is very tempting to think about. However, in quadrant 1, all the trig functions are positive. In quadrant 2, just sine is positive. In quadrant 3, just, uh, just tangent. And then in quadrant 4, cosine is positive. So we need sine and cosine to be equal but opposite. So quadrant 1 is out. So our answer, our first answer, the first time velocity is 0, is going to be a quadrant 2 angle. So our reference angle is pi over 4. Now, theta is usually the notation we use for angles. I know they're using t here. So we'll just say that t is equal to, and in quadrant 2, we would do pi minus the reference angle, or 180 degrees minus the reference angle if it was in degrees. So we're going to have pi minus pi over 4. So the first time this happens is going to be at 3 pi over 4. And you could even check here. Cosine of 3 pi over 4 is equal to negative square root 2 over 2. Tangent at 3 pi over 4 is equal to positive square root 2 over 2, but the minus sign makes the match. So this is definitely the first time that this velocity is equal to 0. So now we have to find the acceleration function. And the acceleration function, we do another derivative. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. And then we have the derivative of sine is cosine. So then what we're going to do here is we're going to plug in 3 pi over 4. And this is going to give us negative sine. 3 pi over 4, and be mindful, this is still a quadrant 2 angle, plus cosine of 3 pi over 4. Now, once again, sine is positive in quadrant 2, so that minus sine is going to keep everything minus. We have minus sine 3 pi over 2 is square root 2 over 2. And then here, cosine in quadrant 2 is negative, so we're going to have minus, and cosine of the reference angle pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. So this will combine to make negative 2 square root 2 over 2. And then the twos cancel, giving us just negative square root two. And this matches up with choice A. Okay, well, this is going to wrap up this no calculator multiple choice section. Thanks for sticking it out to the end, and good luck on your AP test.